Hi, and welcome to our Meta 9 session with the Space Traffic Management Perspectives from the 2022 Diverse Dozen. We appreciate all of you being here and welcoming the space community, joining us from over 91 countries on the live stream. My name is Megan Jordan, and I'm your room host. Outside of hosting, I'm a Brooke Owens and Patty Gray Smith Fellow and an aerospace engineering student striving to make a change through aerospace and community engagement. Before we get started, just a reminder that you can find the session's details along with all the session and program details at ascent.aiaa.org. For both our virtual attendees and those of you in the room, please use the Q&A app available at ascent.aiaa.org slash meta09 to submit your questions for this panel. The Ascent team will be monitoring the conversation and providing questions to our panelists. Now, if you aren't familiar with our Diverse Dozen program, it is the brainchild of our moderator, Marie Baja. It is the exclusive Ascend community of the thought leaders and activists whose intellectual and emotional commitment to keeping the off-world environment free of debris knows no bounds. In this group, you'll find emerging thinkers and leaders from all around the globe. Today, they'll be featured in a series of rapid fire lightning talks that highlight the most important issues surrounding security, safety, and sustainability in the context of space traffic management. That said, I'm incredibly excited to introduce this session's moderator, Mariba Ja, among many other titles and distinctions. Mariba is co founder and chief scientist at Privateer Space. And two weeks ago, Mariba was named a 2022 MacArthur Fe Fellow. Whoop. Please join me in welcoming Mariba to the stage. All right. Um, thank, thank everybody uh, for, for coming out here and everybody who's online. And um, I just wanted to say the following, right? I mean, it's been great to collaborate with the AIAA and Ascend in being able to bring uh, you know, this specific uh, type of event to Ascend where 12 people from across the globe get to have a platform to speak to each and every one of you uh, about things that are important related to space environmentalism, sustainability, uh, and these sorts of things. So I really appreciate that. And I'll say that, um, you know, my path into this whole thing in space environmentalism started uh, when I was a security guard in Montana guarding nukes at Maelstrom Air Force Base, and I saw dots of light go across the sky and I had no clue what these things were. And I thought they were UFOs at first, because um, uh, they were to me. And uh, it turned out that these things were human-made objects reflecting sunlight. And uh, I'd never been in a place with such dark skies before. So I grew up in Caracas, Venezuela, lots of city lights. And uh, actually, it dawns on me that you know most of humanity is very disconnected from our sky, because most people live in fairly populated areas. And on a good night, they might see the moon, but they don't really get to see dark skies and I think that is of detriment to us but that's another topic so in any case I got really motivated to be able to um, try to investigate what these human-made objects reflecting sunlight were and I left the military and studied uh, astrodynamics the science that studies motion of stuff in space and you know I worked for NASA's jet propulsion lab uh, doing Mars missions and that was very exciting but somewhere around 2006 I left JPL to go to Maui with my family at the time. They wanted to have that tropical island experience. And on Maui, um, I worked uh, for the Air Force Research Laboratory. And with the telescopes on top of Mount Haleakala, at that time, we were basically tracking 26,000 pieces of garbage orbiting the Earth. And it was, it was like I had no idea that there was that much trash at the time. There was like 1,200 working satellites. 26,000 pieces of junk ranging in size from the cell phone uh, and larger. And living on Maui, looking at what people on Maui do with the landfills and single use plastics from the uh, tourist industry and plastics in the oceans, it just, I started connecting things between land, air, and ocean and how we are behaving with regards to space exploration. We're just trashing space just like we do all these other ecosystems and that space is really a finite resource at least orbital space where we put satellites it's a finite resource and you know to this day we're still not coordinating and planning what we launch how we do it and that sort of stuff i mean just think of this just a few years ago um i remember 
a good year for launches was like having 12 launches per year. That was like, wow, it's a busy year. We are at the point where we're having 12 satellites being launched per week and we're headed towards 12 per day. That's where we're going if we look at just on average. That's a crazy amount of objects. And we've doubled the working satellite population just in the past couple of years. Um, you know, half of those, I think, are Starlink satellites at this point. And we are headed towards a tragedy of the commons unless we do something different. And by living on Maui, going to Alaska, seeing how there are pockets of indigenous people that hold steadfast to the belief that all things are interconnected and that we are in an existential crisis every day. Most people don't believe that or see that, but many indigenous people live their lives that way. And the only way through that existential crisis is stewardship, is having a successful conversation with their environment. Indigenous people for millennia have recognized that unless they harmonize with the environment, unless they behave with the environment in a way that allows mother nature to give them a feedback on the unintended consequences of their actions, if they don't do that successfully, they don't make it. And the rest of humanity has abandoned by large this intergenerational contract of stewardship for ownership of, state, of things. Ownership says you have rights to claim. Stewardship says you have responsibilities to claim. And so this is what this is all about. It's really this idea of all things being interconnected, this idea of embracing stewardship because our lives depend on it, and this, this, this intergenerational contract that we're trying to enroll people on, and how do we then recruit empathy across humanity to solve these problems? The biggest challenges aren't just technical and political, it's really a lack of empathy. Uh, most people say, well, that's not my problem. They see themselves as independent from this. And I don't believe that independence is true. I think that if you see yourself as independent, is because you haven't looked far enough, you haven't looked long enough, and you haven't looked deep enough. And if you do those things, you'll see that the problems happening on the other side of the planet, things happening in Africa and not the United States, that sort of stuff, are all our problems. And space is that as well. So one of the things that um, I've done in my own career, given this idea of environmentalism and what I'm doing with Privateer, and I'd like to thank Privateer again for being a sponsor of uh, the D12, is we are trying to make knowledge ubiquitous across humanity, find ways to get people with really cool ideas access to data and information to solve some of these wicked problems. And regarding space, we definitely want to make space more transparent. So what's up there? Who does it belong to? What can it do? We want to make space more predictable, not just where objects are going to be over the next minutes and hours, but in any common situation, how will two space operators actually behave, the decisions that they might make? And then we want to develop a body of evidence that can help people and uh, basically hold them accountable for their behaviors. So we have this platform called Wayfinder, and uh, anybody can access it at privateer.com and, and, and see some really cool things and even uh, you know predicted collisions and that sort of stuff. But in order to really scale this, uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, announce that, um, you know, if we want to make something like a Waze for Space, where just like Waze, the traffic app, I get to put in information here. There's a piece of debris here, and, and I, as a user, get to input information that everybody, all the other Wazers, benefit from. How could we crowdsource information across the globe to really keep space safer, more secure, more sustainable? And uh, the most ubiquitous uh, astronomical sensing system in the planet is from amateur uh, telescope folks. And so it gives me great pleasure to say that uh, Privateer is partnered with Celestron, uh, the makers of probably the most ubiquitous uh, home amateur um, you know, astronomical system. And we're going to try to motivate people to look up. So not, instead of don't look up, please look up and you know, get these things out of your closets and look at some cool nebula and stars, but every once in a while you're gonna see things that aren't that going across the field of view that are human-made objects, and we're gonna ingest that into Wayfinder and make that accessible to everybody. So with that said, I wanna say that uh, out of the 12, we weren't able to get all 12 of the diverse dozen uh, here. We're working on that. 
uh, in the next few years, we'll probably get some more sponsors to get everybody here. But I want to say that I'm so incredibly proud of each and every one of these folks, including all the uh, diverse dozen from the previous two years as well. And it moves me greatly because the things that I've seen them do um, completely dwarfs anything that I have done. And that makes me feel very good for what I'm trying to do here in my, my own dharma. So that said, um, I'm going to get off the stage. I'm going to tell you that the way this is going to shake out is that we're going to first show you videos of the D12 that weren't able to make it. And then after that, you're going to hear from each one of these fantastic human beings and uh, what they have to say. And at the end, we're going to do some questions and answers and just keep rocking and rolling. So much love and aloha to each and every one of you. I really, really mean that. We're one community. Thank you so much. Let's make this happen. Hi, everyone. I'm Selene. I'm an archaeologist and manager of Spaces Group. First, we have a problem. We are repeating the same mistake all over again. This time, the planet orbits. Earth's orbits are not worse, so they have started to be erased and overcrowded, with its 131 million debris moving with an order of 25,000 kilowatt kilometers per hour and sea surface. So we have 5,000 active satellites, estimated to become 100,000 in just eight years, and the aid in navigating our daily lives, from facilitating our communications to determining the weather. And even though these satellites help us mapping the climate effects of excessive resources, resource use, and consumption on Earth, we are paying too little attention to how crowded Earth orbits are become. We need to do more to protect what has given us so much. Because the problem, other than overloading the orbits, are the over-accumulated debris, which are a current threat to satellites and the ISS. So think of orbits as a highway with no traffic lights with a soon crossing or traffic management. Well, you can sit crossing it on your way to the moon. When debris have already threatened the life of astronauts on board of the ISS and made a hole in the Canadian Arctic Army, we cannot act just after Happens. As the universe is vast, I think Earth orbits are almost infinite, but it's not the case. We are again let future generations solve the problems that we created, as it is happening to our polluted oceans, land, and atmospheres. This is how we also value space, Earth orbits, and the night sky, which also opens us to use to navigate the sea, to know when we start to harvest, and to be inspired and answer philosophical questions. All of these and many more are of uh, humanity's intangible cultural heritage, about the connection that space, the universe, that always had on us and how it influences our lives, costumes, and even religious rites. Just think about the comet that got the three men to a new reality. We saw an incredible and profitable resource in our planet orbit. And we started to exploit them as no binding multilateral rules regulate orbit's usage and safety. But maybe we can create a solution by also recognizing the intangible, intangible heritage that space is for humanity. We need to establish rules that value the safety of both the people and the human made objects, and that can guarantee a sustainable use of space and the safeguard of cultural property. Don't get me wrong, sustainability in the culture, cultural heritage together and it doesn't mean that we're not going to put any other object on earth orbits. Cultural heritage is needed to build a sustainable future because it builds on the lessons from the past building up on this by meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And here I come to my conclusion and proposition. Recognize the Earth orbits as UNESCO World Heritage Site to safeguard these precious resources as well as objects historically important for space exploration. Cultural heritage does not end in monuments or objects. The UNESCO Heritage List includes landmarks or areas of historical, cultural, scientific, or other forms of significance to the human, such as the Statue of Liberty, created by a multidisciplinary team. It's a symbol of human spirit, ideals such as liberty, abolition of slavery, of slavery and virginity. 
and the satellite of Vanguard 1 would become the first outer source object in this list. Launched by the US in 1958, it's the oldest human object in Earth orbits today, and it was made possible thanks to international cooperation. We also involved the first of citizen scientists. Recognizing Earth orbits as a UNESCO site will set up a precedent for the safeguard of the outer space environment and human heritage, helping to update the four decades old outer space treaty. Yes, we'll be facing many obstacles and challenges in the process. Remember, we chose to go to the moon not because it was easy, but because it was hard. Thank you. Hello, it's an honor to be here with you today. I will tell you a bit about how astronomy and the night sky are in danger by our satellite constellations. Let's first talk about what's going on in the busiest volume of space we have, low Earth orbit. Since 2019, the number of active satellites in LEO has seen a tremendous increase, almost exponential, thanks to Starlink and OneWeb constellations. But as you can see in the numbers here, these are not the only ones. Many more are planned or in early deployment. According to plans worldwide, the number of the total number of satellites in LEO can exceed the 400,000 by the end of this decade. This is, of course, a huge technological feat. But as with all technological advancements, there are always some drawbacks. So how is this night sky affected? You might have seen this view yourselves or have read some news articles about it. These are trains of satellites in orbit racing, reflecting sunlight and appearing even brighter than many stars in the sky. A similar thing started to happen to astrophotographers also, where long exposure shots are now being striked by way more satellites than before. Of course, a satellite reflecting sunlight is not something new. But add to the equation the huge numbers we were talking before, and now you can imagine how drastically our view of the night sky can change. But if the unaided eye can see satellites, imagine what telescopes can do. Professional astronomers were actually the first ones to raise alarms about this. In the optical domain, the reflected sunlight can photobomb the extremely sensitive detectors of telescopes, generating stripes as they pass and rendering images almost useless. In the radio domain, the signals used for communications with the ground can increase the background radio noise or even blind radio receivers for a short period of time. Astronomers are already struggling with the existing population of man-made objects in space. Take, for example, a group of astronomers that thought they had discovered the oldest gamma ray burst ever detected, when in reality it was a disposed rocket body just passing by and reflecting sunlight like a flash. Unmitigated, the huge numbers of satellites planned can severely affect astronomical observations. But don't think that this is only affecting basic astronomical research. Telescopes are also used for some critical applications. Optical telescopes are used to detect asteroids with potential collision course with Earth. Imagine what can happen if we miss one of these. Radio telescopes are used to refine the reference frame of the Earth that is used for satellite navigation, the one thing that I'm sure all of you have used today. And many other applications use telescopes like for example, searching for techno signatures of extraterrestrial intelligence or searching for other Earth-like planets. So probably now some of you are wondering, is it too late? Are the night sky and astronomy doomed? And the answer is no. We are in time to understand and to mitigate these effects. Astronomers around the world have quickly reacted to this situation, organizing international workshops and started collaborations with the most advanced satellite operators to find ways to mitigate this problem, both on the telescope side and on the constellation side. The International Astronomical Union, together with the European Southern Observatory and the Square Kilometer Array Observatory, are working at the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and at the International Telecommunication Union to raise awareness on this situation and to encourage the development of of international guidelines. In parallel to this effort, the AU has also created a Center for the Protection of the Dark and Quiet Sky from Satellite Constellation Interference. This center encompasses a very diverse group of stakeholders, but all collaborating with the same goal. Also, as a result of all these efforts, 
Some countries have established national protections for radio telescopes, and satellites operators are working to mitigate the reflectivity issues. This is really good, but there's still much more work to do. So I would like to finish with this takeaway message for you. Space should be for all. Large satellite constellations can bring great benefits to society, but it's important that they don't affect our ability to enjoy and to study our skies. Raise awareness, get involved. The time to act is now. Thank you very much for your attention. Nicole Engineer. I'm a published essayist regarding advocacy for workplace equality within aerospace manufacturing, and I'm the CEO of Green Arrow, which is a land remediation company. Before I worked at SpaceX out of college, I could be seen across the RIT campus where I worked as a shop assistant, a friendly face to help other students out when I was an undergrad. I also built a variety of vehicles from cars to a rocket. My first ventures into space were based upon the very specific belief that if I just worked hard enough to do what I cared about, it would definitely get done. And so this past year, I also became a more vocal advocate for equality than I really ever have been before. When I examined the role that I played within aerospace, I recognized that the social issues that I faced from an environmental and a social perspective had an impact that affected each of my teammates across the board in varying ways. In this case, sustainability is intersectional and dare I say, optimistic. And so for those of us who are honored to be part of the AIAASN conference, I think that we have all found a way to sort of do the impossible. And so when we look at the current manifest of launches, satellites, orbit repair mechanisms, and the thousands of people that create the supply chain to make that all happen, I think that we can see the pursuit of a future where space continues to be an ally has an important impact on those who valiantly and proudly continue to do the work here on the ground. A shift in the ethos of the space industry is more than a concept, it's a potential future for us. One which values reducing dependency on fossil fuels, responsibility for our waste outputs from manufacturing, and it emphasizes reusability. But these are only a couple of the well-known technical requirements. So I think we should dive in a little bit further into the life cycle of a launch, which starts with mining of materials for manufacturing, this is performed by people, and then machines and people shape and form the materials, those tanks are then fueled, the quality checklist is complete, and now we are ready for launch. And so for our finale, we'll be bringing the rocket and the satellite back to Earth. Each step of this process creates emissions. And if we can face that concept and address it now, I think it will help us better understand how we can address its impacts in the future. This is why an examination of the economic, cultural, environmental, and social impacts of the full production process is necessary. In my opinion, Collaboration on creating a space industry that supports zero carbon emissions, prioritizes diversity, and promotes a safe working environment creates a keystone habit which will influence the future of the planet. So when I was in college and an intern and a full-time employee, and even to this day, I still hear the phrase Ad Astra by old and new engineers. This translates to, to the stars. But as I've grown with that message over the last few years of my professional career, I found that its meaning carries a much more dense and stunning message in its letters. I think it means that there's inspiration to be found in the future of space and the stars above us and the vastness of what can be accomplished when people believe together in the possibility of a mission. A sustainable future is possible, and that's my primary mission. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so proud to be part of the Diverse Dozen and have a great rest of your conference. Thank you so much. Hey, Space Watchers, thank you very much to the Ascent team to select me, to select us into the 2022 Diverse Dozen cohort. We are very honored. We, that is the diverse team that works with me. I'm Tor Screening, publisher at spacewatch.global. There is not such thing as a global communication language. There is individual vernacular influenced by cultural differences, historic backgrounds, and a multitude of races nations as as many minds as their people in the world. Such profound cultural differences don't help to bridge a dialogue when it comes to international diplomacy. How many times? Communication regarding orbital proximity and rights of way has become muddy or tense because one part 
could not understand the intention and the expectation of the other part. Cultural background, language differences, and social rules matter even in space debris management. How to deal with these differences in a peaceful and collaborative way? How to create a common language that can foster peace rather than aggression? The common approach is cultural homologation, using English as a standard language. However, languages contain identities and respecting cultural differences is vital to foster the next generation of space exploration, especially if we want space to be the new frontier of equality and inclusion of all nations and not the next battlefield. This is why cultural representation and individuality is important and it's important to foster respect for local cultures and differences. The International Space Communication Network, spacewatch.global, is truly global. We are based in Europe, but we do not ask our contributors or team to be Europeans or to think as Europeans. We create a space where intercultural interaction is fostered and cherished in its most genuine form. Everyone who can contribute to a global understanding of space is welcomed. In fact, these differences are our strengths. We built a series of regional web talks in local languages to foster space and space debate in native languages. We have embedded hosts in dozens of countries. They speak the local language, know the local experts, and sense the local needs like you never could from the outside. Together, they have a unique communication mouthpiece in this global space industry that reaches decision makers domestically and can elevate issues on a global level. Our goal is it to plant a seed that hopefully will grow into a more global understanding of each other and hopefully support a more peaceful dialogue when incidents occur. But let's hear from our team. Ciao a tutti, io sono Emma, sono di Milano, vivo in Italia, sono l'editor in chief di Space Watch Global e la presentatrice di Space Cafe Italy. Ciao. Hi, I'm Stephen Freeland, I'm speaking to you from Australia and I am a Space Watcher. And I'm also the host of the Space Cafe Law Breakfast. Sziasztok, Urban Victoria vagyok Magyarországról, Skóciában élek és én vagyok a vezető hírszerkesztő. Hi, hello, I'm Karen Monter. I am a New Zealand German living in France, and I'm the event coordinator at Space Watch Global. Привет, меня зовут Ирина Морозов. Я из России. Вы тоже пусти Space Cafe Россия на русском языке. Namaskara. Nan Hesaru Sagrika Banduri. Nan Bengaluru, India, and the Electronics Communication Engineering Order today. Space Watch Global, Oregade, Nano, Senior Social Media Manager, Mate Editor Hage, Ken Samak today. Hi, I'm Angela Matisse. And I'm Scottish. I'm here in Edinburgh, Scotland, and I'm the host of Space Cafe Scotland. And behind me is the famous Arthur Seat. Ciao, sono Maria Teta Bucari, sono italiana e vengo da Torino. Sono una coordinatrice eventi di Space Watch Global e una appassionata di diritto dello spazio. Hi, I'm Blaine Curcio. I'm an American living in Hong Kong, and I'm the host of Space Cafe Hong Kong. Hong Kong, mini Joshua. Come on, Nigeria, mini Modei. When Nigeria. News editor, New Mini Space Watch Global. Shalom. I'm Amy Lapariente. I'm Israeli, Shakai Israeli. Of course, I'm Shakai Shakai in Morocco, Romania, and Italy. I'm Amy Lea, she's Space Cafe Israel. Hola, I'm Michel Uyan Grosde. I'm so Brazilian, I'm in Brazil, District Federal, Brazil. I'm so a presentador of Space Cafe Brazil. Hi, I'm Jessica West. I'm Pleiadian and the host of Space Cafe Canada. Unity in diversity they say, and we could not agree more. I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and your interest. Of course, we would love to be in Las Vegas, but hey, Ad Astra, and don't forget to become a space watcher. AIWSN Diverse Dism, my name is Mahad Nair. I graduated from the United States Air Force Academy class of 2014, like a machine. Um, I studied astronautics and I also have background in space systems engineering. I only have five minutes, so I'm going to be quick about things that I want to talk about in promoting a safe, secure, and sustainable space governance. 
we all have heard the values we talk about when it comes to space sustainability, empathy, inclusion, stewardship, agency, cooperation. But how do we, how do we practice these values when it comes to space sustainability? We have also heard everyone talk about space being the next platform where the tragedy of the commons might become a reality. But how do we bridge this gap between values and actions? For actions or agency, we need a model of governance. So thank you to Secure World Foundation. I was reading one of their articles when I read about the polycentric form of governance, which deals with uh, the scholarship of the commons and the scholarship of the commons deals with the tragedy of the commons. So fundamentally, the nature of space operations is highly dynamic and decentralized. Such a model mandates polycentricity for safe and efficient operations primarily because the stewardship of the respective anthropogenic space objects lies with different owners and operating bodies. Hypothetically, a polycentric space governance system is characterized by decentralized operations, autonomous decision making, overlapping jurisdiction, mutual adjustment of decentral uh, decision centers, standardization in the forms of norms, values, and rules, and effective coordination at all levels. So in order to make this interesting, I did a mind, mind mapping exercise. I read every single diverse dozen op-ed that has been written before and uh, tried to put it in one of the facets of polycentricity. And it turns out every single op-ed or every single article that has been written in promoting space sustainability actually falls into one of the facets of space sustainability, of polycentricity or polycentric form of governance. These facts, facets are multiple decision centers that have overlapping jurisdiction with autonomy of authorities and effective coordination at all levels with an emergent order and a standard uh, set of rules, values, and norms. I will just talk very briefly about multiple decision centers and overlapping jurisdiction. We all have these sensor networks from all these different countries and corporations that have that take measurements, radar, radio, uh, astrometric, photometric measurements of space objects and give rise to a space traffic uh, management system. But there is little to no cooperation between different decision centers or agreement on the thresholds of probability or if the collision data messages need to be acted upon. So when we see, when we put all these problems into polycentricity, we have all, all the stakeholders, all the countries, all the corporations, all the all the organizations who have to who have a shared responsibility whenever there is a, a threat of a collision or a collision data message that has been generated. So uh, by by this 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 gives us this gives rise to shared jurisdiction or overlapping jurisdiction between different decision making centers with a certain level of autonomy. No matter how decentralized the global space traffic management system evolves to be, there has to be a framework of overarching rules that govern the system from an operational perspective. Moreover, polycentricity also promotes existence or existence of means for effective coordination at all levels. The different levels we already know in space governance are of satellite owners and operators, regional networks, national agencies, and international organizations. So in conclusion, polycentricity or polycentric governance addresses maximum, if not all, issues the current space environment is facing. It fundamentally practices empathy and inclusion through an institutional arrangement involving a diversity of decision centers acting independently but under the constraints of an overarching set of rules, values, and norms. Polycentricity is empathetic, inclusive, transdisciplinary, and humanistic. That, that brings an end to my talk. I want to thank Dr. Mariba Ja for all his mentorship and Helen Kang for all the administrative, administrative actions and to AIWSN for providing us this fundamental platform. Together, we will make space more safe and sustainable for all the generations to come. Thank you. Hello, I'm Krishisha, a mechanical engineer and artist from India.
I am the Asia Pacific Regional Communications Manager at the Space Generation Advisory Council. The problems of space safety, security, and sustainability can be solved by enrolling humanity at large by making use of the Earth. Those domains span across technical, legal, socioeconomic, and political fields, and yet there is a lack of allocation of resources to deal with space debris. To develop solutions to tackle this problem, we must first highlight the dangers of space debris to the public view. Attracting public attention to the daunting problem of space debris will initiate and drive policy and industry changes towards space safety and sustainability. First, to provide an understanding of the universal experience, whereas ours are the universal understanding of a personal experience. They are both a part of us and a manifestation of the same thing. This famous quote by artist and astronaut May Jemison highlights how science and art are the avatars of human creativity. The arts have always played an important role in promoting space exploration through media and literature. Visual art can stimulate human emotion, deepen emotional perception of the human environment by means of creating artworks and installations. Art can influence the very notion of our reality and as such empathize with space every problem to create a safer future for humanity. Art created through an interdisciplinary approach of artists, engineers, and scientists can send a profound message about the infinite vastness that surrounds us and the importance of collaboration to tackle this issue. Space and art both address themes of security, contamination, hybridity, survival, and innovation. The creative collaborations of art and science will be mutually beneficial to addressing the complexity of the space debris issue. There have been very few experimental projects that try to bring space debris to the public view by making use of art and different art forms. Collisions by artists Richard Clark and Mark Mantle it was one of the very first few projects, which is an interdisciplinary site-specific artwork and a performance created by using known data from orbiting space debris around Earth to generate musical and visual information through a shared computer program. Subsequently, Collision 2 was also created by artists Richard Clara and Mark Patio. Collision 2 is a space sculpture made up of 192 pieces of orbital debris located in the region between 96 and 104 degrees of inclination and an altitude of 450 to 800 kilometers in the year 2003. A video simulation was created to show how the orbital constellation sculpture looked like from the vantage point of low Earth orbit and geosynchronous orbit during a 12-hour period, which was later reduced to 12 minutes. This was accompanied by an audio cre composition created around the data collected by monitoring the space debris. Collision 2 extended the parameter of earthbound art set in motion by the first collision piece with a strong conceptual aspect of the four-dimensional element of time. Both the collision projects utilized orbital debris that was already in orbit to create art, and hence the problem became the part of the solution. Another interesting project at the intersection of space debris and art is Adrift by artists Kathleen Couture and Nick Ryan. Adrift explores the world of space junk through an interactive experience of sound installation and a documentary. An electromechanical sound instrument was developed to track the position of 27,000 pieces of space junk, transforming them into sound real time as they pass overhead. This project aims to engage the audience by viewing, listening, or interacting with multiple elements. A wider audience of more than 300 million people worldwide were reached since it was produced online and easily accessible on virtual platforms. Currently, there are 131 million space debris objects ranging from the size of 1 mm to 100 mm in orbit. With the demanding concerns of space debris increasing, it is crucial to draw the general public's attention towards what we currently done to address this and how far we have yet to go to solve this critical problem. In the new space era, access to space and space knowledge has become easier. Public appeal opens up the door of communication channels to policy makers to develop initiatives and allocate resources. By creating empathy and awareness, art projects and installations can showcase the interconnectedness of safety, security, and sustainability. Using art as a medium of collaboration, communication, inclusivity, and awareness would accelerate humanity's efforts to address and expedite solutions for solving the space debris concerns.
Can we have another round of applause, please, for our diverse dozen cohort who joined us online? Now we're going to pivot to our diverse dozen cohort who joins us here on stage. Um, first, we have Mac Lee Kiro, who's a space warrior from New York that outside of space loves house music and comic books. Uh, we have Uma Shingeri Arudmatas, a passionate uh, aerospace engineer from Malaysia. Uh, JJ Hastings is an artist, scientist, and explorer. Uh, Joseph Ofos, postdoc researcher at Oshu Institute of Technology, Japan. And then we have Paul Buerly, who works as a flight dynamics engineer for space sustainability at Astroscale in the UK. And then lastly, we have Kim Ellis Hayes, scientist, attorney, space workforce, force, and education specialist. That's good. Right, so let's go in that order. So, it was, yeah. So yeah, that was me. That sounds like you, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for the introduction, Megan. Hello, everybody. My name is Matthew Carroll. Um, like Megan said, I'm a big, big fan of house music. In fact, one of my favorite lyrics goes, it's not about what you got, but it's what you do with what you have. And what I think what we have in the space industry and on Earth to help us with the existential problems is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Just to give you context on it, the Sustainable Development Goals were developed by the UN in 2015 to get 17 interconnected goals to serve as a blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet. I'm talking about goals like urgent climate action, um, creating sustainable cities and communities, innovative growth, um, no poverty, clean water for all. I'm talking about decent work and um, economic growth, all really aspirational stuff. Wouldn't it be nice if we had something like this for the space industry, right? Well, uh, something that could give us a literal blueprint on how to move for the future, a sustainable development for all of the of space industry. Well, I have some good news and bad news for you. Good news is these actually exist. You Google sustainable development goals, put space, you'll see a list of the SDGs and an analogous version of the space version one. The bad news is that these are nothing more than just suggestions, right? So something that's this much of a game changer, I feel like it needs to have some more weight behind it. it can't just be all theory, it needs to be action. So what I'm calling for is a mandated version of the space sustainable development goals from the UN. And I was whoa, 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 I'm a space lawyer, so I know a lot of uh, people are annoyed by like, red tape and bureaucracy that happens in the space industry, especially because the law never really follows the technology. It never goes on the same pace. But luckily, the UN has actually done this in um, 2017 when the General Assembly made the space, made the sustainable development goals mandated. So I'm saying we could just add something. We could just even add a portion of this for space, right? And like you might be asking why. Why do we need this? And let me just get to my notes real quick. Like the Artemis Accords, it's important to recognize that the frame of reference that a sustainable development goals can add for the space industry for a greater sustainable future. How can it help you act? Just look at the sustainable development goal for climate action, right? It helps with um, weather forecasting, disaster management, and climate change monitoring. If you look at Earth observation tech, for instance, because of that technology, it's developed the essential climate variables that the UN gives to be able to provide reliable, traceable, and observation-based evidence on how to monitor climate and climate variability. And just at Copernicus, there's about 50 of these uh, essential climate variables. Copernicus by itself was able to cover 30 of them. So just think about what, this is what space can do for one of the sustainable development goals. Think about what it could do for the other 16. Okay. And I know like when you mentioned uh, creating a, a resolution like this, people might say, oh, the UN already has working groups for this right, which they do, but they don't have the teeth to actually draft laws and create mandates. And when you're doing something like this, it puts the onus on different countries to practice space and their space activities in a sustainable, safe, and responsible way. And it also forces them to assess the risk of their long-term sustainability. And like I was saying, so the UN was trying to have their sustainable development goals reached by 2030. And it doesn't matter whether it's 2030 or 2060, because that's irrelevant here. What is, is important is what we do with what we have. And thank you for your time. Yay.
hailing from a non-spacefaring nation, Malaysia. We had a huge gap in the space race 20 years ago. However, today, in 2022, we are building our own Earth station and space technologies, which will be able to assemble CubeSats on our own. CubeSats are small class satellites, which is in the size of 10 centimeter cube. These CubeSats, they will work exactly like how the other satellites are working, and they could, they could work in a swarm of satellites as well. The emergence of CubeSat in early 20s, it has positively impact on space exploration, especially on non-spacefaring nations like Malaysia, Uganda, Cuba, and many more nations. However, these CubeSats are potential deadly hazards for space infrastructure, satellites, and even the CubeSat itself when there is no coordinated space traffic management system. If you were to ask me, how could such tiny satellite be so hazardous? Now, I want all of you to imagine a bullet. When it's stationary, it's perfectly fine. Once it's loaded into a gun and fired, boom! The power and speed, it's deadly. It is exactly the same when it comes to CubeSats. When they become space debris and moving at high speed in orbital space, it is equally deadly. The new space era has high urge or demand for CubeSat market as it has lower cost of manufacturing and lower barriers to enter into the outer space. If we could think exactly, the space education and space entrepreneurship growth has assisted the space policy frameworks for CubeSats to use space responsibly. Unfortunately, the call for coordinated space traffic management is still unattended. CubeSats are often Considered, uh, considered as sustainable alternatives for gigantic satellites that we have today. Yet, in reality, there are two major concerns raised. Number one, the potential space debris hazards for the CubeSat itself from the shared resources from NASA and ESA. It tracks or space debris which measures 10 centimeters and above. Anything lesser than that is often classified as million pieces of space debris and even worse when it becomes untrackable. Untrackable simply means they are unpredictable and unpredictable space debris is definitely hazardous and lethal for the CubeSats. Number two. The decay of the CubeSat, highly dependent on the atmospheric drag. Simulation studies show that the best case scenario for CubeSat to decay, three years. However, in the worst case scenario, it might take up to 122 years. Yes, you have heard it right. The failure to address these concerns, which simply means that we are going to put out more and more number of space debris up there and ready to face a debris-filled space. The UN SGD 18, Space for All, promotes space exploration from all countries. It is equally important to have a safe, and sustainable space, and this can only be achieved with coordinated space traffic management. The exponential growth of CubeSats, one in 1997, the first launch, and there have been more than hundreds in 2021. And in 2032, the numbers might go up to 10 
thousand CubeSats. Remember, it's exponential. All of these 10,000 CubeSats are able to take over the commercial satellites that we have today. And this simply means that the chances of collision between them and with the existing space debris increases as well. The urge to commercialize the CubeSat market, to optimize them, it's already happening today. And it is reshaping the new space era. It is our responsibility together to provide a safe and sustainable environment by having great space traffic management awareness, tools, technologies, and ecosystem. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is time to channel our resources into developing a coordinated space traffic mm -hmm. management. With that, thank you. Well, there. You do really well. Like if you walk around, was really good. Huh? Good day. So I guess you know I'm from Australia. I, I've personally always been fascinated by the invisible space magic that happens. And you all have one of these. Just a few hundred miles above us, there are thousands of pieces of debris, but there are also satellites, space stations, and whizzing around like bullets in their designated orbits. All of these space assets provide us with this invisible space magic that I'm talking about. Launch companies have, have increased the cadence of launches over the last decade. And with that, they have brought valuable assets like satellites to space, astronauts to the space station, Missions involving the launch of small satellites have also increased with governments sending uh, missions and, and special operations satellites. Universities and research organisations and commercial companies specialising in space applications. Even though there are so many satellites in the sky, when you look up during the daytime, you can't see anything. It doesn't look like anything's going on above us. When you look at the night sky, like Mariba talked about before, you can see satellites and the space station as dots moving quickly across the sky if you know where to look. And astronomers point to more and more light pollution preventing them from taking measurements. I hate to break it to you, but there are 100,000 more launches and satellites planned for the next few years. So that orbital environment is about to become even more jam-packed. We still won't see this stuff during the day. We'll see a little increase in the dots during the evening and there'll be a a lot more light pollution for astronomers. And debris will continue to grow and create risk to our critical space infrastructure provided by the satellites and the space stations. Do you know we already have the tools at our fingertips to solve this problem? to not only decrease the development of new overall debris, but to create more resilient satellite systems across the board. Space is a multidisciplinary industry whose workforce is comprised of more than scientists and engineers. If we leverage workforce education for trades, colleges, universities and professional education, 
I believe we can significantly move the needle on this. As simplistic as it sounds, eliminating the generation of more debris on orbit and increasing satellite resilience is the development of a strategic education plan. Now, this would be a really big project, <laughs> a multidisciplinary education plan for a range of education and vocation levels. And I know it's a big job because I've already done it. As the Space Technology Education Program Manager at Swinburne University of Technology in Australia, I led the design and development of Australia's first multidisciplinary space education program. Co-designed with industry and embedding industry partners within the curriculum, this program was designed to support the Australian Space Agency Workforce Development Goals for 2030 to triple the size of the Australian workforce. Not a small task. Important sustainability principles were embedded into the program to ensure that the next generation of Australian workforce have the skills they need to develop sustainable solutions. Important sustainability principles and tools like crow's nest and data sharing applications could be developed as a massive open online course or disseminated as through a web platform. To empower the US space workforce with tools that will move the needle significantly on debris reduction and removal. It could also be made available globally to empower the global workforce and infuse collaboration into all of our space activities. That way, future generations can continue to look up at the sky and marvel in this invisible space magic. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Joseph from Japan, from the Kyushu Institute of Technology, and um, I'm very glad to be here and thank you for your time. The space debris um, problem, pollution problem, is my problem, it's your problem, it's everyone's problem. And um, I want to make an argument for the case that one of the ingredients to solve this um, issue is to have openness and inclus inclus inclusivity. So um, now it is well known that um, in 2021, the um, revenues from the space um, global economy was about, was a little bit above 380 US um, billion dollars. And then also um, investments for startups last year was twice as much for that of 2020. So in 2021, um, startups received about 15 billion US dollars in investments, which is a very, very good thing. And this simply means or translates into more dependable services, more reliability, more ways to do things easily and comfortably. However, there is this um, perception that not just the perception, but there is this observation that every one of us is dependent on satellite services for communication, for navigation, for weather forecasting, and many other things. But how many of us are aware of the problem that the space um, debris can, can, can create? In other words, we depend on these satellite services, but most of us do not even care about the byproducts of our advances in space science and technology. So I would like to say that the only way we can solve this problem is to bridge the gap, is to do an active um, information campaign whereby I become an amb ambassador, you also become an ambassador, and then we go out there and then preach or talk about the issues of 
of, of, of space debris. Now, um, one thing I would like to say is that we, we, we all know that um, space agencies around the globe are identifying, they are tracking, and also cataloging um, space debris out there. But like my other colleagues have said, there are millimeter sized objects that cannot be tracked. And these millimeter sized objects can also create a lot of problems. So for instance, um, in the late 1990s, um, JAXA launched an advanced Earth observation satellite. And as soon as it was launched, it came to an abrupt end because it was revealed that a millimeter sized debris impacted one of the power harnesses and a billion dollar, um, a multi-billion dollar investment just went away with all the intended missions that were planned. So these are one of the ways that um, debris in space can affect all of us. And then one thing we can also say is that the space debris pollution problem is an activity in continuum. In other words, even if assuming that we are not going to launch satellites anymore, the harsh environment of space will continue to create more debris because the, uh, the particles that we, we already have in space will, will defragment or they will go under various degradation. And then also with the collision problems as well. So it's, a, it's an activity in continuum and we can forecast and see that in the few years to come, there'll be so many active objects out there. And so we have to come up with a solution and we have to come up with ways to be able to deal with this menace that is um, facing future posterity and all humankind. So one of the ways, as I've said before, is to create a sense of global awareness, whereby you are an ambassador, I am an ambassador, you are contributing to the solution and everyone is contributing to the solution. If discussions on these issues is perceived to be um, the constituents of a select few, then I'm afraid that we are doomed because um, public perception will not be out there to encourage more funding into um, technologies that would help us deal with this problem because it is expensive to do debris study and then also to, to, to implement them. So the only way we can get the conversation going is to get everyone on board. Already we have um, space-based radar systems and also laser ranging and optical tracking systems that are helping us identify some of these objects. But we need more technology, we need more solutions that would help us advance this um, solution for space debris problem. So in conclusion, I would like to say, what I would like to say is that I'd like to encourage each and every one of us to be ambassadors for, 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 for a healthy, a sustainable, and then also um, a very viable, safe and secure space and earth environment. So that is what we have to do. And we have to make sure that everyone is involved in the conversation. Um, there will be people with dissenting opinions, but we have to accommodate such dissenting opinions because together we can make the space environment safe for all humankind on earth. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone. I'm Paul Boyale, working at Astroscale. And so if your car was broken, would you, you wouldn't leave it in the middle of the highway. You would call for experts to remove it from there because everyone can imagine that having an inert object vehicle in the middle of the road, it would cause congestion, severe congestion. It would force other users to do maneuvers, which can be dangerous, and it can cause deadly crashes that would spray debris all over the roads. So this is the reason why, for the same reason as car can be removed and retrieved from the road, satellites must be able to be serviced and removed from orbits if they have a premature failure. So today, the space technology and research, the application brings tremendous benefits to everyone's life all over the world. 
but the space business is shitting itself. We are launching such a huge amount of satellites and even more in the next years, which is good in a sense, we are bringing more services to everyone. However, we risk, we elevate and rise the number of risks of collision between all those objects orbiting around our planet. So we need to make sure when all those debris, uh, all those satellites are in orbit, that whenever they have uh, a failure, we can be able to retrieve them for the orbit. Because if we don't, and a collision happens, it will take years and years for all the debris, the, me, uh, the thousands of debris generated to go down. So we don't want anyone to be stricken uh, by this belt of debris around hers. So this is why it's really important for everyone to understand. If something happens, we need to know who, that there is a bit of responsibility from everyone. And it's really important that everyone knows whenever there is a, an accident in orbit, you, and, and it's, it's hard to be liable. It's, hard, it's a heavy burden when it's your satellite that causes a catastrophic failure for everyone. So if the, um, sorry, the, um, the number of, of debris of satellites is growing as never seen before, so the number of satellites which are not uh, working anymore is going to grow as we never seen ever. And for this reason, we really need to be ready to clean the orbits. And this is not the responsibility of a company like us at Soscale. It's everyone's, uh, everyone's needs to be there to, to fight against, uh, to fight for a sustainable space. And we all know that space is really hard. Uh, everyone knows it in this room, I guess. So we never know when fate uh, will hit us and uh, kill a satellite, which finish the mission and put in danger all the other satellites in orbit, in the same orbit and below. When the satellites die, sad story, it will put in danger every satellite in the same orbit, but also everyone's below. And it takes years and years, decades to come down. So having, um, allowing uh, other satellites to come and bring those satellites down is important for the future because we cannot keep, keep up with that number of satellites in orbit and just let them float, uh, fly um, without any precaution. The, um, the main risk, um, sorry, the main risk with uh, all those uh, satellites in orbit is that we cannot control them once they finish their they, they life. So it's important. It, it's it's a, it's it's when it's too late uh, to to control your satellites. Uh, it, it's important to have someone who helps you to retrieve it from the orbit. Um, sorry, I I lost my my words. That's dude. <laughs> Everybody here loves you, man. Just do the thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Thank you. I lose my voice all the time. <laughs> I <People> like that. <laughs> well, what was the next point? <laughs> um, there's a race. Technology development. We need to have technology developments for sustainability. We need to join the two force, the two, two, two ambitions. We need to improve our systems as we as always done. We will always have people ready to work for 
to improve to, to solve the issues the technical problems but we need to keep in mind that uh, we need to find solutions which are sustainable for the next five years 10 years 20 years 50 years because the next generation needs to have um, all the service we have already but they need to be able to continue to develop and if we we don't want to put us ourselves in, in risk of losing all of that so it's it's important that everyone's work together like all the stakeholders for this from the space community works together because if there is a, a collision that happens and other escalation of events it will impacts everyone's on earth uh, everyone on earth will be heavily impacted and so it's really important to, that everyone's work uh, every stakeholders together so that we can have a sustainable uh, space use for the next generation so in a nutshell i want to remind that or uh, in orbit servicing is a key for the next uh, years to come because we need it to be able to continue the space services for Earth and for our planet. It's, it's not an easy task, uh, we all know that. And I wanted to finish with the point that um, it's, it's, we are all in the, on the same planet, it's, it's the same spacecraft. And we want to, to continue flying together. And for that, it's, imp it's really important that everyone's work together and we need to take starts having taking actions now for the benefit of of all thank you very much good morning coming into afternoon I'm jj hastings i'm an artist scientist explorer and um, I'd like to request, if it's possible, um, for um, our AV support to bring up the video essay that I created for you, because um, I'll be honest, um, I could describe the incredible work of some of the artists and designers that are out there that are addressing this issue of, of space debris and what it means to take up the space uh, above our surface um, and what it means to be in space. So um, it, if that's up. Would it be paused to reframe our present condition? What if we remembered that the space we occupy on the surface of our natal planet is intimately connected to the space we explore away from it? Or, as the artist Thomas Saraceno once succinctly put it, we are already in space now. What if we enfranchised artists, designers, and makers with the capability of putting to another use what so many in the space sector consider to be a nuisance. What if instead of focusing on the scale, the mass of the problem we created for ourselves, that 10,000 tons or the tens of thousands of objects, we focused upon the matter itself? What if we went in search of the glove that slipped away from Gemini 7 whilst Ed White was on his historic EVA? What about the cameras and tools that have slipped away from astronauts over the past decades of human spaceflight? What if instead of pursuing the removal of trash that stands in the way of progress, we went in search of cultural treasure and safeguarding historical artifacts? What if we encouraged work like that of Chinese American artist Xin Yu, who creates artwork using decommissioned satellites still in orbit and the debris from rockets that have come crashing back to Earth? What if, like Shin, we chose to allow others to play and create with retired satellites still in orbit? They're still at work observing our planet, collecting and storing imagery, forming archives of data over time. Because Shin is both brilliant and precocious, she was able to figure out how to make her own series of images entitled Atlas. But imagine if others learned from Shin's example and were able to create their own artwork. What if material, electronics, and structures from inoperable spacecraft and satellites were resurrected in new forms as parts of cultural objects? The practice of bricolage, of repurposing a diverse array of objects, usually those that have been discarded, 
to construct new forms with new meaning has deep history in art and cultural practices. What if artists like Simone Vega were able to gather parts of former rocket boosters, fairings, electronics from long defunct spacecraft? Perhaps most widely known for his Third World Space Station, an enormous sculpture comprised of 30 modules designed to reflect his hometown of El Salvador. The materials and motifs he includes sharply contrast the sleek, sterile modules designed for the new commercial space era. It is a matter of fact that the era of disposable spacecraft must come to an end. There's every indication that significant commercial opportunity exists in the formation of a wholly circular manufacturing and servicing economy in low Earth orbit, and that it will have irrefutable environmental advantages. But beyond the technological and commercial growth we will witness in this new space era, we can also expand our support for the cultural exploration of space and the support of initiatives and work led by artists, designers, and makers that can lead us toward addressing the questions that still sit at the root of it all. At the core of my message today is to ask, what if we let artists, designers, and makers lead the way towards deciding the future of what debris lies above the surface of our Earth? And the second is a call to remind ourselves, as Thomas Saraceno said in the video that I shared, we're already in space. The boundary between Earth's space and what lies beyond is a very thin, thin gradient. So today, I guess I would like to wrap with, uh, before we start a discussion, um, a call for us to consider who it is that's leading this discussion and who's leading the resolution of the problem that we've created for ourselves. Thank you. Okay, so we do have some questions from our audience today. First of all, I just want to take some time uh, to thank our panelists again, both our panelists that were online and our panelists that are here. As you probably noticed, it is really difficult to make a presentation without any notes and to stand in front of an audience to do that. So they did an amazing job. So please go ahead and, and give them another round of applause to thank them. Hey, everybody, we did it. Okay, so one of the questions that we received says, the Federal Communications Commission adopted a new rule on September 29th that will shorten the time for satellite operators to deorbit low Earth orbit satellites from 25 to five years. Will this help? Will this help this issue? Are there other countries that are working on similar policies? Yeah. Look, this is your stage. I got answers to lots of stuff. This is you guys, come on. Well, uh -huh. um, I think whilst it's it, it's an extraordinarily good step in the right direction to uh, reduce the time that it takes to deorbit a satellite from 25 years to five years, there's still the question of addressing, you know, the production of debris that that got that satellite to orbit in the first place. So it's part of the answer, but it's not the entire answer. So I applaud them for a good step in the right direction, but there's other things that we need to think about. Anybody else up here have any? Yeah, like it's, it's I think it's a really good step for, for the, the space flight because from 25 to five years, in five years, it's around, uh, 100, 120 thousands of orbits what satellites will do. Mm -hmm. So we go from 600 thousands of, of orbits to only, to, we divide it by five. And during all this period of time, all the satellites that go down will avoid to, I mean, it's, it's so much time worn where there are less risk of collisions. And there is another, po another question is, what for the satellites that cannot go down because of a failure, how, how to deal with that also. Yeah. Anybody else have comments about that? Yeah, I'll add something. I'm just worried that, uh, so we have the policy that's come out, but I don't know if the technology is there to meet it because like Paul was saying, what about the satellites that can't come down? How are we gonna do it? Is there a market for, or are there companies out there that are willing to engage and take that task on? 
So I know this, I think this law goes into effect in two years. That's a, a short amount of time, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Fingers crossed. Anybody else? I think it's a step in the right direction, although it's not an all, all, all encompassing solution. Um, um, but regarding the technology to get them deorbited, I think what you can do is that you need to have a propulsion system to lower the orbit a little bit and with drag, it will get into the atmosphere eventually. So I think um, technology is not really the issue, but the will to do it, because I don't know if it is if it is really going to be rigorously enforced from the beginning, but it's a step in the right direction. And then also um, the UN also requires that before you put something in space, you register it. So um, it's also one way to track and then also to be able to tell whether after a certain number of years, whether you have deorbited your satellite after its um, life mission. Yeah, so it's a step in the right direction. Anybody else? So I guess I would uh, add a counterpoint. Um, I actually don't think it's such a, a wise idea. Um, it will simply uh, place increased demand on launch services, which increases consumption overall. Um, it will mean that we will have to build and deconstruct, deorbit, ablate, destroy um, satellites um, at a greater pace. So it just simply accelerates consumption rather than planning for um, equipment that has a longer lifespan and would therefore demand fewer resources all overall. Cool. Anybody else? In my opinion, I feel like the the purpose of the purpose of having it into a lesser years, I think that could be in order to make it significant as when the development of satellite is making and there will be allocation of resources and allocation of resources and costs, oftentimes the deorbiting would get the lesser percentage or lesser attention as that is not the core cost or core reason for the satellite to be up there. Mm -hmm. And when this number from 25 and it's being reduced to five, it's just making it to be look significant for the developers to know that this is important and we have to address this no matter what. When it comes to 25, maybe slowly and slowly, we tend to forget it or just leave it and let's just see another way of how we can bring it down after the retirement of the spacecraft itself. So when it becomes five years, we have no choice. We have to take an action right now. That's what I feel. I love that. I will say just on the tail end of that question, you know, for, for me personally, I feel that, um, you know, any uncontrolled reentry is really abandonment. It's not disposal. So if people just want to say, okay, well, I'm just going to be in a sufficiently low orbit. And when my thing dies, mother nature is going to clean my mess. I think that's, you know, complete and utter bollocks, as they say. Um, so something needs to be done about that. And disposal, responsible disposal means controlled reentries and, and designing your satellite for demise so that as it burns up in the atmosphere, it's not leaving a bunch of crap in the atmosphere as well. So I think that's the direction that we need to head. But nobody asked me personally. All right. Do we have one more question? We do. So we're we're nearing the end of our time. So this will likely be our last question. But how does each panelist define an existential threat? And what specific actions do you propose to mediate what you believe to be the greatest threat in space? I love that question. I'm glad I'm not a panelist. <laughs> Existential, well, existential threat to whom or to what um, always is the root, right? Um, if we're talking about human civilization, that's, you know, another debate. I, I would I would say existential threat with respect to space debris, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a stand quite yet. Um, I will defer to those who have much more informed opinions. Well, um... You could make an argument that it's some kind of threat, but I don't know if it is existential. So um, even though this is a problem we have at hand, um, it doesn't mean that we are all going to be wiped off the face of the earth in the next generation or something like that. So I wouldn't consider it an, exi an existential threat, but I think that it's a problem we are faced with. and. It is something that can be dealt with because we put 
these man-made objects into the um, into beyond our atmosphere. And so I think we have the capability and we have the um, the technology and the know-how to be able to handle the problem because we created the problem in the first place. I think we are able to deal with it. So I don't really regard it as an ex existential threat, but it's a problem we are faced with. So that's a really interesting question. And I think um, to preface my comments, I'd say that there's always this balance that you have to achieve between commercial development and ensuring that the environment is um, not polluted more so that we, we affect operations down the track. So there's a balance, there's a careful balance between those and all of the legislative uh, instruments that governments around the world, the US government, the Australian government, try and reflect that balance. So it is the threat of space debris is something that we have created ourselves. And so we have a responsibility to address it. And I think that as commercial business is affected more and more by the threat of debris destroying spacecraft or, or um, you know, providing a threat to our astronauts on orbit or as we move out further into space, then we will address that threat because we have to. We've always had to do these things in the past. So I think um, the threat is that we won't do it quickly enough and the environment will degrade really is, is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, for the next three, we, there's a countdown, so. Oh. All right. The, in my opinion, I feel like the threat for the space industry would be all on the confidential items that we do have. The confidential information, yes, I do understand, I do respect. However, when it comes to one solution to be taken or a networking or even a work together with another, per, another people or another organization that would be hindering on making all of this to become safe and also accessible. And that's where the informations are being guided, kept it only for the particular organization itself because it's confidential. I think that could be one of the biggest threats for the space industry. Yeah, to keep it short, an existential threat for me happens when you realize, like, what when you ask, what are we even doing here? What are we doing in the space industry? So when it comes to space debris, I think the biggest threat is that we actually have no regulation in how to handle space debris. So like, there's really no laws on what to do. Yeah, and in 20 seconds, <laughs> um, yeah, the the main threat we have uh, with the space debris is to lose all what we are using. But humans lived before us without them. It just we, we wouldn't be ready for it at the moment to come back ages ago. So we just to save that, save space. <laughs> Thank you so much. And that brings us at exactly zero seconds left. <laughs> um, I, I, are you gonna say some words? Yeah. Okay. So can we have one more round of applause, please? All right. Hey, thank you, everybody. Yeah, education is something I'm super passionate about. So I definitely think the multidisciplinary educational approach that you were talking about uh, really resonated with me. So thanks again to Mariva and the 2022 D12 cohort uh, for sharing your thoughts and perspective with us on how we can have a more sustainable um, future. So thank you all so much. I, I appreciate that. I also uh, just want, you know, one more time, I, I'd like to thank um, the organizers and also Privateer for sponsoring um, uh, this cohort of D12. For some reason, I requested like some theme music, like the business by Tiesto. You should like find that and put that as we as we march off the stage here, because that would be awesome if you can do that. And let's see what happens. But um, I want to thank each and every one of you um, for being here and participating uh, in this. I guess that brings it to uh, a wrap for uh, this year's D12. And I just want to thank each and every one of you for everything that you do, um, what you've done so far and what you're going to do um, you know, after this. And, and thanks for making it over here. So thank you, everybody. Much love and aloha. Thank you. Thank you.